Dr. Guy Schumann, who is an internationally recognized senior scientist active in flood related projects. He holds several affiliations in both the US and Europe, where he works mostly on NASA, European Space Agency, and Group on Earth Observations funded projects. He holds an academic research posi uh, positions at the University of Colorado Boulder and the University of Bristol. He's also an associate at ImageCat, which is an international risk management innovation company supporting global risk and catastrophe management needs. He is also the founder of RSS Hydro, a European research and development company active in areas of earth observation and computer modeling of water risks. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Guy. Uh, please take it away. Hi, Dave. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Dave, for that introduction. Um, try to share my screen. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so, okay, try to do it. Um, I can probably do, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I do this right. <laughs> so, uh, let me see. Um, let me know if you can see this one. Um, can you all see my screen? I yep, so. I think. Yep, I think we're. I think you're good to go, Guy. Please okay, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, today I'm going to talk a little bit about something different. Something I've been working quietly over over the years with a number of people, like Albert. Also, it's not work on my own. It's a lot of work and effort that went into this. Um, it's about mapping floods in urban areas from spatial, uh, from space at local risk level. So how do we get satellite information in urban areas when it floods? Um, so uh, it's with a number of people at the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology and with a, a, an Italian-based software company that developed um, a really cool online platform for developing and processing large amounts of Earth observation data. I will introduce a number of things here, and you know, I, I'd be quite critical at times also about things we have not done as we should, in my view, with remote sensing and other things we really do quite well at, at this point. So bear with me, and um, hopefully, it will be a bit of fun as well. So, overview just quickly I talk about urban flood mapping in general. Um, I give a brief history of EO. Uh, of floods, earth observation of floods. Uh, then I talk a little bit about earth observation and floods, what's the problems and, and promise, uh, where are we now? Um, earth observation and online compute platforms, I give a little bit of an overview of that. Um, and then I talk about the flood hazard mapping in open bare soil areas and, and urban areas. And then I conclude with some uh, perspectives. So just, I think a lot of you know, urban areas is where um, basically where most assets and people at risk from flooding are located. Um, you know, of course, we have rural open areas as well where many people live and agriculture is a big component that gets hit by floods as well. But generally, urban is the areas we would love to map um, and they're very complex. They're very highly localized scale. Um, and I said, a very complex process, urban flooding. Um, mapping is very difficult, no matter what type of imagery you use, whether aerial photography, drones or satellites, they're all very difficult to map. Um, also because there are many different types of man-made objects in an urban area that can um, play games, so to say, with the signals uh, from remote sensing. So it's very hard to distinguish, for example, in an aerial photography, um, it's very hard to distinguish brown flat waters from dry, bare soil um, that's also brown. So that's not so easy as one may think. Uh, on the other hand, like from satellites, it's very tough because of spatial resolution and then also optical because of the cloud cover. So traditionally, therefore, we've stayed a bit away from uh, satellite remote sensing in urban areas, and we've basically looked at field-based methods, like some of these images showed, like people literally doing, drawing marks on their homes where water stood. So as you see on the top image there, and now we move towards drones, you know, they, they could be useful, but are very hard to interpret as well. The, the photos you got from drones, they can be oblique, they can be um, 
again, under, under various weather conditions, not easy to interpret. Um, then we have the Earth observation so satellite sensors that have many limitations, as I mentioned before. But if they can be used or could be used, then there's an immediate big benefit for use of Earth observation data. And I'm not just talking about reinsurance insurance, that's an obvious one. I'm also talking about uh, the UNWFP, for instance, that Albert mentioned. They're very keen to see if we can map urban flooding from uh, remote sensing, uh, especially satellites. So very quick, brief overview. I think this is very cool and has a lot of hidden messages. So we can go very far back in time with the first Landsat mission, for instance, and say, okay, when was the first actually paper being published that you can map floods from space? Well, as, as early as 1973. Uh, this is a US flood on the Mississippi, fairly cloud free, and you have optical Landsat that was able to map that at 30 meter resolution. For that time, absolutely amazing. But then, of course, with floods come clouds. So it wasn't until 1987. And as I always try to tell people in Europe, it was not an ESA satellite, but it was a NASA satellite that mapped the first flood using SAR technology. So NASA's uh, CAB satellite over Bangladesh in 1987. And believe it or not, but this very detailed flood map you see there in the dark, it was full under cloud cover due to the tropical cyclone in that year. Anyway, then we realized, okay, that is great potential for remote sensing. Maybe we overpromised because there wasn't any major breakthrough until like say the year 2000 with the international charter. So that's a lot of um, satellite agency coming together, pulling resources together to uh, put their satellites on top of the location where the disaster hits. That's a very good initiative. But that wasn't an advancement in Earth observation per se. So it wasn't until 2003. And I think that's what started the idea of um, the Dartmouth Flood Observatory that Albert showed, if I'm not mistaken, because then it was really clear that you could map uh, floods with daily coverage using NASA's uh, MODIS Terran Aqua satellites. So for the first time, I think it was very clear that we could go into global mapping and hopefully, you know, doing this daily or at least weekly with the cloud cover. So that's all possible. Then again, it took a really long time until Europe launched the Copernicus program that freed up the ESA SAR satellite Sentinel-1 and also the optical Sentinel-2. So this is now all open access. So if you put ESA's missions plus NASA's missions open access together, you have a whole lot of data proliferation. And then in 2019, there was a really cool effort. I was happy and very lucky to be involved in. It was actually students and researchers putting their heads together for machine learning and earth observation. Uh, they come up with an algorithm based on machine learning that is now uh, doing a test flight in, in space uh, on board the satellite. And they were using optical Sentinel-2 data to, to map floods. Obviously, you still have the problem of cloud cover, but it's for the first time that this is now a possibility to map floods on board a, a CubeSat. So um, again, you've seen this history, and I think one of the biggest problems initially was that we may have overpromised a bit what remote sensing can do. So because it was only possible to do flood mapping really well in wide area flood mapping, like wide area coverage, uh, Manual algorithms exist nonetheless to, to map floods over these scales from radar, optical, even thermal uh, based algorithms were developed early on. But a lot of these maps are being used to support situational awareness assessment like um, Albert was very well showing on his previous talk. However, typically open access EO imagery works well over open water rural type areas. So if you go into the urban areas where most people at risk from floodings are located. Um, traditional flood mapping algorithms applied to these free satellite data have serious limitations. Um, so let's see what's possible today. So very recently, over the last couple of years, there have been really big research efforts done in the SAR coherence-based analysis. And this actually enables urban flood mapping um, to be done. So let me just give you a brief 
technical overview here what that is. So SAR uh, signal coherence processing, as I say, holds now a lot of promise. Uh, it's basically looking at the SAR signal change over time. So if you take an urban area, uh, you could say it's fairly stable because a lot of these man-made objects don't move over time. Buildings are very stable. But if then a big change phenomenon like flooding or any other big change happens, then that changes that SAR signal. So it's looking at this uh, relationship that enables us to look at, you know, what where flooding in urban area hits or an earthquake for that matter. And so if you take the image on the on the right here, red in the image on the right depicts this change, you know, uh, it's 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 largely a drop in coherence due to flooding. But then you say, okay, what what are the other red areas? It's all red, but that's because other land cover types undergo change as well. So for example, vegetation can change. So all of this would be depicted as changed too. So that's the really big problem. And it's not until recently that people have managed to overcome that issue and single out the change due to flooding because they were able to look at, uh, first compute a very large archive of non-change SAR scenes for example, looking at what the building footprint is, and then only using those areas to look at the change. So saying, okay, what buildings are flooded? And that is now possible to do. It's very computation intensive. That's also a reason why it's only done recently. Um, it's really computation intensive to look at this entire archive to find the stable uh, building footprints. And I think we need much more validation cases. So the red image I show here has been taken from a paper by Marco Kini at, at, at the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology and uh, his people at, um, in Italy as well. So it's an open access paper, everybody can look at that. And here's another great effort and it's a lot of NASA um, funding and, and sponsoring and work went into this. This is developed by uh, Sang Ho Yoon uh, back then at JPL. So it's a damage proxy map, but essentially it does the same uh, thing more or less. Um, so it's it's looking at this loss of coherence um, to say, okay, where is the damage occurring? And that damage could well be earthquake or flooding. Um, but so if you know what the event type you look at is, then you you basically relate the change to to that event type. So that's it. And now if you say, okay, it's computationally intensive, how do we do it? Well, I think nowadays we could literally go online, cloud compute, and, and put that algorithm to work. So that's what's happening. A lot of um, IT, you know, uh, cloud-based compute platforms are available. Google's Earth Engine is one of them. Unfortunately, I think for the moment, Google doesn't host any uh, Sentinel-1 coherence image, uh, but they may well do in the future. So more data, more processed information and always faster delivery. That's the demand coming from the end users or stakeholders. And that also makes online compute platforms really appealing. And there are also many non-experts that want to make use of the data, process it, and be in control of running the algorithms themselves and getting the maps. So simple tools and systems therefore need to be developed for complex systems like this uh, SAR coherence-based algorithm. Because a lot of non-experts don't really care how the algorithm does it. They just want the urban flood extraction. So solutions is to develop these online platforms for developers and end users alike. And I just give you one example of a possible platform called WASD. It's a, it's an ESA effort at the beginning, uh, and now it turns in, in turn into a, um, basically a, a company, but a company remaining very flexible to serve academia, scientists, and, and commercial entities alike. So basically what WASD does, it allows any developer to develop in their own language. So whether that's Python, IDL, MATLAB, Octave, et cetera, that's fine. You can also develop on your own computer. Uh, when you're done, you can drag and drop it into the platform and it will serve it out to the cloud, fetching uh, images that are available uh, from, from nearby data centers. And also cloud computing is not limited to a certain provider, but it's it's how much power the end user or the developer wants, and um, you can get it from a multitude of cloud providers uh, through WASD platform. So, just as a quick example of the applications from a uh, number of 
developers that are already up there available on WASD to try out is the hazard algorithm by list developed by list um, it's basically the algorithm works for open area rural um, areas so it's it's basically using a, a difference imaging in SAR and so it calibrates then the statistical distribution of the open water uh, backscatter and then thresholds it um, and, and the change detection is essentially used to optimize uh, the fit of that distribution so uh, it's been evaluated in a large number of cases and I believe the uh, people like the DFO and other people around the world use very similar algorithms to map um, open area uh, wide uh, spatial scales flooding. So here's an example of the urban flood mapping from Sentinel-1 I just outlined on uh, previous slides to execute it on the WASD platform for uh, a disaster in Jakarta. Uh, and it, it's actually been validated by the Indonesian National Institute of Aeronautics and Space and other um, field rescuers. And they were actually very happy with the results they saw uh, from Earth observation. But again, they weren't so wowed by the fact that it's from a SAR system, very much coarser resolution than building block scale, but they were more wowed by the fact that it, um, it, it, it glued so well with what they observed in the field. So for people like myself, that's obviously a, a big milestone in, in capabilities of open access, um, free Earth observation data. Um, so I myself tried this algorithm out uh, during the European floods and I gave it a hard test case. So some of these maps you see are not really great. They're missing a lot of flooding. But what is amazing is that we can actually start mapping very small villages in Belgium here as an example and, and very small urban areas densely populated, very close to rivers. Um, as you can see here, and we start identifying individual buildings in front of which there is the flooding waters. And so every blue area you see should be in front of a building uh, showing considerable flooding. So uh, having tested that with actual authorities in Belgium, as I say, a lot of areas are missed, but those that are mapped are generally correct. So that's a, that's a huge uh, step in the right direction as well. Uh, just to give you a bit of background for the Chaux-Fontaine area on the right, you see the algorithm took four hours to compute. So we still have to do a lot in algorithm optimization efficiency and, and computing efficiency as well uh, to make it really usable. But it's, it's, it's just very complex to run. So conclusions, I hope I'm still on time. So conclusions is um, that basically Although remote sensing and observation has over the years advanced in its capabilities to map floods at different spatial scales, most of this has been very limited to rural open area flooding. Recently improved SAR sensor technology and advances in online compute power enable mapping floods in urban areas at a, at a scale, I think relative to building block scale. And that gets very, very useful for both uh, rescue organizations and uh, insurance reinsurance as well. So in terms of online EO platforms, even though the number is growing, there are not many that develop, that offer a service that for both developers and, and user as well. So I presented here one of those platforms, but there are a few others, um, Up42, for example, also. Um, giving, a, you know, I gave a brief overview of IT infrastructure and, and, and briefly described two of the applications offered in, in the context of global flood mapping including urban areas so that for me this including the urban areas now i think this is the first time uh, that people are able to say this um, that you can map flooding in urban areas with fairly low resolution uh, SAR uh, satellite data so yeah for questions i mean here's my email i'm very happy to answer any questions now if there's still time and i just want to give this picture of of the floods in in, in germany this summer you can see why an urban flood mapping from space would be so important because being faced with this kind of scale as a fire rescuer, I mean, you just wouldn't know where to go first. So you need to have this situational awareness overview also in urban areas, it seems. We're getting a lot more of these floodings with climate change as also outlined by Albert earlier. So I think it's, 
it's now we're getting to scale where also in, in urban areas, uh, satellites are probably the only way to, to help. So, yeah, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, really, really fascinating presentation there, particularly the, the kind of taking a step back from the timeline that you had early on in some of your slides, particularly noting um, the launch of Landsat 9, um, literally just days before, and the, the, the trade-offs and you know, benefits and limitations between optical and radar when it comes to flood mapping. But I think there's no doubt the, the time, time series aspect, at least, which current we only have for a, you know, a longer period of time anyway from optical and which started with Landsat um, yeah. is, is so important. There's one particular uh, question that I see here is, uh, how do you envision Landsat 9 helping with these global flood evaluations, including timeliness for response um, to address uh, things like scan patterns and, and return times over locations? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, I think the power of Landsat is exactly what Dave, you just outlined it's it's there for 40 years and it's still going i mean it's amazing that there's a lot of interest very much still and and also the funding available to now be at landsat 9. Uh, i think the power in there is not so much for response but more for global flat risk assessments because you can actually start looking at 40 years of high resolution data and and there has been a nature publication by uh, people from Cloud to Street, and also including Albert, by the way, and, and, and Bob Brackenridge, using this approach with MODIS. But actually, you could, you could envisage such an approach with, with Landsat, although you only get the 16-day coverage. But I think having high resolution in, in a lot of areas available is really great. And if, if I also look at, and actually from a response perspective even, you could, uh, you could just get lucky. I see a lot of Landsat cloud-free flood images, the one I showed on the Mississippi in 1973, but also NASA Earth Observatory publish, publishes very often these great Landsat scenes cloud-free of an ongoing disaster. And many times that is being missed by uh, stakeholders in active in emergency response because they don't think of Landsat as, a, as an asset, but it could be because just by simple luck and, and cloud-free, you get a very clear high resolution image. Uh, the other thing I just want to very quickly say, when I first saw Landsat 8 image, I thought I was I would be looking at a very high resolution image compared to the old Landsat series. It's the same spatial resolution, but the spectral advances are, are, are fascinating. I mean, looking at something like Sentinel-2 and Landsat 8 or 9 is just um, mind-blowing in terms of spectral improvement. So you really get more information just because, not because you change the spectral, uh, the spatial resolution, but because you have advanced in, in, in calibrating the spectral signatures so well that it's actually very, very cool. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I think Dave, you you mute if if you're saying something. Sorry about that. Thank you, Guy. Um, we have a, a couple of uh, minutes left and, and a couple more questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, okay, what are sure. what are your validation measures for local flood risk? <laughs> yeah, I think I think the the first one that comes to my mind, uh, field based surveys, like I showed on the first slide, for example, the individual people just victims of floods literally like marking their homes for where the flood water stood and also taking nowadays taking pictures uh, it's very easy with a phone uh, some people may use it to um, you know to have evidence for claims they may they may file but these kind of things can be very powerful for validating any urban flood um, we can map or, or urban risk uh, for that matter so I think that is still the best available validation data. Um, other than that, you could use drones, but drones have their own problem. Um, so it, it's not so easy to fly a drone in an emergency situation, for example. So I think field-based is still the one I would I would go for. 
And the, although <clears throat> probably not largely on a global scale, not not widely available, but airborne as well. Even yeah, airborne, airborne as well. That's very true. Airborne yes. opti high resolution optical, but again, availability yes. would, would be the or, you know the biggest restriction yeah. on that. Um, last question for you: Are you aware of any plat any platforms that integrate vegetation and built environment to predict flood risk? Uh, of I'm not aware of any algorithms yet. Although to be very fair, I think um, uh, private sector companies like Up42, um, the Airbus spin-off, they go a bit, uh, they go a lot into vegetation. Uh, but also platforms like WASD start to, you know, you can literally develop your own algorithm on there and leave it on there for people to use. And also Google Earth Engine does the same. I wouldn't be surprised if in the future there are people that develop these kind of applications. Uh, and then you can run them on uh, on online platforms. Uh, at the moment, I don't know any of such application, um, but I, I'm sure I, you know, I don't know everything, so I'm sure I'm, there, there's one probably. And you need the, <clears throat> obvious, you know, you need the infrastructure data, and not only do yeah, you, need, you know, yes, not, not only do you need, you know, say building footprints, but you need the relevant attribute data for those data sets, yes. such as first floor elevation of building footprints in order yeah, to I really think, get to the heart of the problem there. Right? Yeah, I think one thing I didn't mention is also when we talk urban is flood defense infrastructure data, right? That is also a stable structure in most cases. And, and that is still very difficult to, to map and also to have. I mean, there are efforts to get global databases of flood defenses. The US military holds a very good one for the US. But essentially, there, even there, there are still many states, many local authorities that hold data on flood defenses that are not integrated in the national database. So I think globally, it's a huge effort needed, but it's very much uh, essential. You're, you're referring to what the national levy database that the Army yeah. Corps maintains yeah, in the US? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a fantastic database. And yet it has holes, um, but, you know, yeah, globally, such a data set would be amazing to have. Um, yeah, yeah. Cause it would help to understand where remote sensing, uh, is better than, for example, a model that doesn't have defenses in. And so it would be really easy to make those comparisons more fair, uh, to any model or vice versa. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Guy, for your presentation you. and your insights. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks everybody.